Okay, Shalom Aleichem and welcome back everyone. Baruch Shechiyon and Vikimon and Yuan Zan Azeh. We are starting, we are starting, Abutai, the fifth Sefer, Sefer Devarim, Mishnah Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu's last will and testament. And we know that Pasha Devarim, Sefer Devarim, Moshe Rabbeinu is really rebuking. Moshe Rabbeinu was really giving Musar to the Jewish people. And it starts off, These are the words. Moshe Rabbeinu is expressing his feelings and concerns using words to the people. Rabbi the Midrash has a very interesting observation of the word divarim. Divarim is davar yam, the words of the ocean. Because words are just like an ocean. How are words like an ocean? Water. In an ocean, what can happen? If it gets very windy and it gets very stormy, then you have a very stormy uh, uh, Tsunami, people can die through them. An evil mouth is like turbulent waves. They can cause people to, to, to be killed. Good, word, good words are like pearls on the ocean floor. Right, if you have the right words, you're like an ocean and you can find pearls and all these beautiful jewelry from there. But a shalom person has the wrong words, can kill somebody. Shlomo HaMelech said, Gentle words of the wise are heard, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Someone here, they bring from Rabbi Guritz, who writes, Words should not be confused with weapons, because words are more powerful. Weapons can only do so, so much damage, but words can completely destroy. Handle them carefully. For words have more power than atom bombs. The tongue has no bones, but is strong enough to break a heart. Be careful what you say. You can say something hurtful in 10 seconds, but 10 years later, those wounds are still there. Hey, he gives you a piece of advice. If you're in a bad mood, that's fine. But don't let bad words get into your bad mood because your mood can change. But Hasha Shalom, those bad words that you used, that can stay for a very, very long time. Speak in such a way that others love to listen to you. And we're going to get into that. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu is doing in this Pasuk. Moshe Rabbeinu starts his rebuke and he tells them, Be'ever hayadin ba'midbar ba'arava mo'sof ben paran ben tofa of the lavan and Rashi says, "Where's tofa? Where's lavan? I never brought." And Rashi explains in the beginning of the parsha, why is Moshe Rabbeinu speaking in such code terminology? He says he's giving them tochacha, and he says, "You know what? I can't say it straight up. I'm going to do it in a little bit of a remez. Why? Mifnei kevodan shel Yisrael." Because of the kavod of the Jewish people. Now, but I never helped, it never worked that if you tell somebody you're dumb, you, you don't know anything, and now you can tell them what to do. It's never gonna work. The minute you say that to somebody, the guy shuts down. But if you say it in the right way, if you're a professional person who knows how to say stuff in the right way, you can say no, or you can say something that someone doesn't like, and they're gonna tell you thank you for saying it. Because first of all, if you really have your heart in the right place, that other person feels it. But also how you use your words. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm going to speak in code. But I will tell you, if you continue Sefer Devarim, Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't stay in code forever. Moshe Rabbeinu comes out with full rebuke. He gives his own kill alot. He's going to give the Tachacha. And he's going to give it. And he says everything in there. More words than Hashem used in the Tachacha. But because he started off with Kavod, you start off right talking to the fellow, then you can continue talking everything you need to talk about. Fact is, people like when you tell them what they need to know. Because 
you know, if a person's walking around with his jacket and it's up like this and up like that, and he's walking around and no one says anything to him, he got no friends. Because if he's really your friend and he really loves you, he'll tell you, listen, fix your jacket. For a second, he'll be a little awkward, but for now on, he's wearing his jacket right. It's the same thing. People who are doing something wrong or, or need to get a little bit of a rebuke and be told what to do, they want to be told. They just want to be told right. They want to be treated like a person. Moshe Rabbeinu starts off Sefer Devarim. He says, I'm about to give you a tochacha. I'm going to start off nice. I'm going to start speaking nicely because words can do anything to a person. Think twice before you speak but because you, your words can influence what happens. A person once came to Reb Chaim Kanevsky, the Chatzadik Lebracha, and he said, my mother is sick. Please give her bracha. And Reb Chaim Kanevsky gave him a bracha. And then he said, no, Rabbi, I want you something else for me. My mother's suffering so much, I want to take half of her suffering. Make it in Shamayim that I get half of her suffering and she only, she, I, I want my mother not to feel it. And Rechaim said, don't talk like that. Say that you'll study Torah on her behalf, you'll read Tehillim, you'll pray extra Kabbalah. And the man said, no, Rabbi, I want half of my mother's suffering, help me get it. As soon as his visitor left, Another man entered Rechaim's room. And this man was crying. Circles under his eyes. Lack of sleep. And Rechaim said, what happened? He says, last week. I wanted to take a day off from work. And they weren't going to give it to me. So I said to my boss. That my grandmother suddenly passed away. And I need to go to the Levaya. I need to go and take care of my grandma. And my, he gave me not one day, he gave me a few days off. It was beautiful. I had a little time in my life. And then what happened? Sure, then my, wife, my grandmother really passed away, he says. Since then, I could not rest. He asked Shreb Chaim, did I cause my grandmother's death? And Chaim said to him, you acted extremely foolish. Hazal tells us that Hashem created a brit with the sifatayim, with the lips. Hashem created a, a covenant with the lips, with the words that you say, they have power. He tells this man, he says, you should study Mishnayot intensely for your grandmother's soul for the entire year. And may this, and with this, Hashem will help you. As soon as it's finished with this man, Rav Chaim tells the people in his family, he says, go get that guy who just came and said he wants to take his, his, his mother's half of suffering. Bring him here. And he tells them, this is the power of the speech. Be careful of what you say. I will tell you, not only can the words that we speak affect someone else's life, they most certainly can affect our lives. Here he brings an interesting acronym. Before you speak, you should think. Right, uh, Rav, uh, Rav Pam would get very upset as his, his Talmidim if they would say, what you may call it? That was the thing they used to say. In the day. What, what you may call it? What, 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 without knowing what to say. He says, if you didn't think it through yet, you shouldn't be talking. In order to talk, you need to think. And what does think stand for? First, he says, is it true? Right? T is, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? It's going to do something for the guy. N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? Moshe Rabbeinu, when he had to give rebuke, he went through all this and more. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in a kind way. And he spoke to them in a way that the Jewish people listened and accepted his words. I will tell you this, especially, especially now during the three weeks, the nine days, and a few days, of it's going to be Tisha B'Av, and we know how Sinat Hinam destroyed. Everyone hated each other. Everyone spoke not nicely to each other. No one stuck up for each other. This is our time to change it. And how do we change it? By thinking before we're talking. If we just thought before we did things, how much things would be better for all of us? Okay, let's move on to our second lesson on this week's parasha. I will tell you, there was this lady... She was coming out of her Beverly Hills mansion, multi-million dollar mansion. She comes out 
and she sees a man right in front of a house. And the man says, lady, please help me. I haven't eaten in three days. And she turns to the man and she says, wow, I'm so jealous of you. How do you have the willpower to stay away from eating? <laughs> Obviously, she heard and she saw, but she didn't hear and she didn't see. There was a, a young student that wanted to come to join a smicha program, to become a rabbi. And he was going to the interview with the, with the rabbi who was in charge of the program. And he comes to the interview and he traveled by train. Comes to the interview and the, 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 the Rosh Hashiva, let's say, asks him, how did you get here? And he says, I came on train. He says, really? When you came on the train, when you got off and you walked here on 96th Street, did you see that homeless woman? She was probably covered in a blanket holding a, a hand-painted cardboard sign. Did you see that? And this young student says, no, I didn't see it. He says, what about on 118th Street? Did you see this guy with a gray beard and a few teeth and he wears off in a baseball cap asking for money? Did you see this guy? And the student says, no. He says, what about the tall fellow with the dreadlock standing outside of, the, of one of the bars waving his hands wildly in the air in prayer? Did you see him? And the student says, I guess I wasn't paying attention when I was walking here. So the head of the shishiva says to him, I don't know how you can become a rabbi if you don't even see anything that's happening to humans around you. You have to have eyes. You have to look. You have to see. This week, Shabbat Hazon. It's the, it's the Shabbat of seeing, of envisioning. The Baal Shem Tov said, if a person is Aicha on the Shabbat, he can see the Geula, he can see the redemption. You see what a Bibu Mashiach comes. We have to have eyes. We have to see things. You have to know how to see things too. You have to know how to perceive things because you can see the same thing. It can be half, half empty, half full. You have to have the right eye. We talked about that. But you also have to see. You can't just ignore. The, the American method is don't see, don't know, don't talk, don't ask, don't this. We can't do that. Person sees, we have to do something. The Yerushalmi tells us a very interesting story. The Yerushalmi tells us that there were people that used to live in Tsipori, in Tiberia, and even further north in Gilad. And every Erev Shabbat, they traveled to Yerushalayim. Now, in the olden days, without cars, that, that is an impossible feat. So the, so the Gemara says, you know how they did that? There were special tunnels that connected these cities with Yerushalayim. So the Maharal says, this is not a posh of the Midrash. I mean, even if you travel through a tunnel, it's going to take a long time. He says that it represents a deeper concept. That these people were so much in love with Yerushalayim, that they were able to get there in no time. They had Kvitzat HaDerech. The Gemara also tells another story. There was a guy who lived in Yerushalayim. And he, he was a shepherd. He had sheep, he had oxen. And one day, one of his oxen ran away. And he started chasing after the ox. The ox went into a tunnel. He goes in the tunnel... He comes out of the tunnel and he's in a different country. He doesn't understand the words. He doesn't understand the language. What's happening here? So he starts talking to the people. He figures out he's in Babel. He's in Babylon. He says, how could it be? What day is it? He confirms the date. It's the same day he left. It's just been a few hours later and he's in, he's in Babel. That takes a much longer time to travel. And, and, and the Mepharshim there explained that what? This guy was so into his money and so into his business that he was living in Yerushalayim, but he wasn't there. He, he wasn't looking at Yerushalayim. He wasn't, he wasn't in Yerushalayim. He was uh, on tour. He was visiting. He, he wasn't really there. And so he got into the tunnel and he just emptied out on the other side. Totally in a different country. Kutzlar, it's Bavo. The, the, the Parsha tells us, Rashi tells us, in the second Pasuk in this Parsha, Ahad Asar Yom Mechorev, it was supposed to be an 11-day travel. And it turned to be a three-day travel. Supposed to be 11 days to get into Eretz Yisrael. 
It happened in three days. But because the Jews sinned, a three-day travel turned in how much? 40 years. Why? Because they lost sight of where they were supposed to go. They lost sight of what they were supposed to do. They lost, they were looking, but they weren't looking. They went, the Moraglim went into, the whole thing with the Moraglim, they went, they saw, but they saw wrong. They came out with the wrong understanding. They weren't seeing right. You can see the beggar asking for food, but you're all jealous of him how skinny he is because he's not eating. Right? You're seeing, but you're not seeing. You're in Yerushalayim, but you don't realize you're in Yerushalayim. So you end up outside. But you're living somewhere else and you feel Yerushalayim, all of a sudden a tunnel opens up for you and you end up in Yerushalayim. The Gemara tells us a famous story. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi met Eliyahu Hanavi at the entrance of the cave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi sees Eliyahu Hanavi, and what are you going to ask Eliyahu Hanavi when you see him? What, what, what would you have? To, what would you ask? When Mashiach, when Mashiach coming? So he tells Eliyahu, when Mashiach coming? So Yahweh you know, he says, you're asking me when Mashiach's coming. I have one better for you. You can go see Mashiach himself. He's sitting at the gates of Rome. All right, he has all the bandages. He's taking them off, putting them on. So Yeshua somehow makes a journey to Rome. And he finds Mashiach. So he tells Mashiach, when are you coming? And what does Mashiach tell him? No. He says, Hayom! I'm coming today. So Shuma Levi is all excited. He says, Today? I gotta get ready. Ah, Mashiach's coming. He gets so excited. He goes home. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. No Mashiach. So the next day, he goes again past this cave of Rashbi. And he sees the Yawanavi. He says, The Yawanavi. Mashiach lied to me. He told me he was coming. Hayom, yesterday's Hayom. So Yom Nami says, he didn't lie to you. He said, Hayom, in tishma'u. Hayom, if you listen to Hashem. Today, Mashiach can come if we're looking at the right place. If we really want him. If we're really doing what we're supposed to do. Where is our priority? Where is our sight? Where is our ears? Where are we? Are every day we're going through some tunnel and coming out somewhere else? Like you wake up on earth and you wake up to do Avodat Hashem and instead we end up in a tunnel somewhere else. We don't even know where we are. What are we doing? I will tell you. Shabbat Hazon. And again and again in the Parsha, Hashem said, look, see the land of Eretz Yisrael. See it, see it. Because you have to see it. A person can say there's so many obstacles. There's so many obstacles for Mashiach to come. The people, the this, the that. There's no obstacles. If we're there, Mashiach's there. Hayom, it comes today. But we have to be there. You have to be ready for it. You have to really be excited for it. Prepare for it. How do you prepare for it? It's not Mashiach. It's not about to make our troubles go away. A lot of people have the wrong idea about Mashiach. Mashiach will make all the troubles go away. But that's not the reason why we want Mashiach. Why do you want Mashiach? The troubles to go away. <laughs> <laughs> what? We want Mashiach. So we can serve our Kaddish Baruch. Mm. We want Mashiach so that the Shechina can come back. The Beit Midrash can come back. <coughs> I, will tell you, I want to end off with our final <laughs> lesson. It's not really a lesson on the parasha, but more of an idea of Tisha B'Av. This is a, a, a mushal from the Dubna Magid, but I think this mushal is such an amazing, deep marshal. There was a Jew who lived in a small town. He was a Tamil Chacham, a successful businessman. He had a wonderful life. Big Baal Tzedaka. His wife, Eshet Hayel. There was only one thing that they were missing. They didn't have children. And every time they dive for children, they got more and more wealthier. Money came from everywhere. The guy was, was a multimillionaire. He had everything. But no children. And they tried everything they could. 
They went to doctors, they went to rabbis, went to Gedolim, Brachot, they did everything. And it was sealed shut. Years and years passed by, nothing. And they gave up hope. And then, all of a sudden, the wife feels she's starting to gain weight. She looks, and she sees she's pregnant. Miracle of miracles. After all these years, they're expecting. They get excited. They go and they buy the crib. They go and they get everything they need for the children, for the child to be born. They have the whole nursery prepared. He's a very successful man. They get everything. The day comes. It's closer and closer to the day of birth. And so they get seen by one of the doctors. And they, they take them to the, to, to the hospital. And she's going into labor. She goes into labor. And one of the doctors come out and tells the husband, it's not going smoothly. Your wife and baby are in great danger. And the doctor says, I'm not equipped to deal with the situation. So I'm calling someone on top of me. And this man says, not only are you calling someone, I'm going to call someone. I have money, I'll pay anybody. So he finds out who's the best, tries to get them in. And they come pretty quick. And the experts come down. And the experts look. And they say to the father, you have a choice. You could be going home with your wife or you can be going home with the baby. But there's no way two are going to be saved. You have to choose. He says, man, doesn't know what to think. Imagine, no one should ever go through anything like this. And so he runs to his rub, where else is he going to go? He needs an Eitzah, what to do? His wife, the baby. So the rub sat there for a few moments in silence and then turned to the husband. And he said to the man, the truth is, I don't know what to tell you. But it's not my decision to make. This decision is your wife's decision. Ask her what she wants to do. And so he goes back to his wife. And he tells the wife, you know the situation. I spoke to the Rav and the Rav says, it's your choice. What do you want to do? And without even thinking for the answer, she says, what kind of life I will have if there's no continuation of the family? There's no question. I will gladly give up my life for the baby. But I have one request for you. My dear husband, she says, when this little baby grows up and is old enough to understand, you will take him to the grave and you will tell him what his mama did for him. And you explain to him how I gave away my life for him. I need him to understand this. Describe to him what a person I was. Promise me that. The husband gives the promise. You can just imagine the scene. The husband and the wife are crying bitter tears. What should have been a happy occasion. The doctors operate. And they save the baby boy. And instead of just taking the child home that night. He ended up taking his wife and getting her buried. The week passed and he came to the Brit Milah, this man all alone. The family came, but you can imagine a man who had his wife for so many years and now she's not there to join the Simcha, the child they've been waiting for together. And the father does everything he can to raise this child. And finally, when the child's old enough, he tells the child, you must come with me. He takes him to the cemetery. And he says, this is the matzeva. This is the, the stone. This is where your mother is buried. And he tells his child the whole story. And he told his child how your mother didn't hesitate to save you. 
so that you can live. And this young man was stunned. He stood there. He didn't know what to say. There were tears streaming down his face. He stood there looking at the grave and said, Mama, Mama, you gave me everything. You gave me my life. I promise you that there will not be a day in my life that I won't think about you. There will not be a day when I don't do something for your neshama. You should have nahat for me and shemaim. And I'll carry on your memory, he says. Your sacrifice will not have been in vain. And so he went home. And for the rest of his life, he spent every single day thinking about his mother and doing something for her. Says the Dunimage, that's the Mashal, what's the Nimshal? The Nimshal is, what's a mother? A mother is someone who takes care of the child, cleans the child, does everything for the child. The Dunimage says, that was our Beta Mikdash. Our Beta Mikdash, a person came, he got kapara, he got cleansed from all his sins. And when HaKadosh Baruch Hu got upset with the Jewish people, and he wanted to destroy them, what did the Beit HaMikdash say? The Beit HaMikdash came up like the mother and said, let my children survive. Kill me instead. And Hashem took out his anger that was supposed to go on the Jewish people. And he destroyed the Beit HaMikdash instead. Do we remember the sacrifice of the Beit HaMikdash? Do we remember the sacrifice the Beit HaMikdash did for us? So that we're still alive today? Because if we did, we would be literally building the blocks of the Beit HaMikdash today. We would every single day remember that the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed because of our sins. And that we have to do something about it. We have to do mitzvot to Masim Tovim. You don't have to go to the Temple Mount. You don't have to walk there. You don't have to walk around there and make problems for yourself and for Halacha and everything. The idea is that we do mitzvot to Masim Tovim and we learn Torah and we learn the Halchot of the Beit HaMikdash. The Halchot of Tumah B'Tahara. The Halchot Kodshim, bringing the Korbanot. We're remembering the Beit HaMikdash and the sacrifice the Beit HaMikdash did for us. We have our mind on it. If we have our mind in it, and we follow the ways, and we speak nicely, like lesson number one, we talk, we think before we talk, we talk with kindness, talk with respect. We have at work, just to segue for a little bit, we have at work something called service recovery. When something goes wrong, a patient is upset, a family is upset, it's a service recovery. And the service recovery model is called LAST. LAST is an acronym, L-A-S-T, and it stands for Listen to the patient or family member making a complaint. Listen. Don't stop them. Then you're going to apologize. Don't apologize for someone else did. Apologize that they're going through this situation. I'm sorry that you had to experience this. Whatever they experienced, that's their experience. Then S stands for solve. You try to help figure out or escalate as need be. And then you thank them. And you just took and I've used it. I'm telling you this works because I've had angry people screaming at me. And after doing this, they've calmed down because you talk to them with respect. You said, thank you for bringing it up to my attention. This guy who was all angry a minute ago, all of a sudden becomes your best friend because you're working with him. You're helping him. You have to know how to talk every time. We have to, I, I love Hinam. We have to love everybody. Why do we have to be mean to each other? Why? And then our second lesson was we have to have our eyes focused. What are we? Who are we? What are we doing? Where are we? Shabbat. Does anyone walk around on Shabbat thinking he's an Olam Haba? I hope so. Because if we think we're an Olam Haba, then we're an Olam Haba. Then you're really in Shabbat. Everything that we do, we have to be focused. We have to be there. Our eyes have to be there. We have to see. We have to know where we're going, what we're doing. And then our third and final lesson. We have to remember what the Beit HaMikdash did for us in its time, high time, it's been a long time, that our job is now to do for the Beit HaMikdash. To follow Hashem's path, follow the Torah, do Ma'asim Tovim, up our game in our Torah learning, what we could learn, what we should learn. Be'ez Hashem, u'bizochet, t'idegula, shalema, b'mher b'yameinu, amen. Amen.